Welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through uh, the epistle of Peter. Uh, last time we finished up chapter 3, and I'm excited today about starting chapter 4. Believe it or not, chapter 4 and chapter 5 are some of the most um, important chapters for me in my life. Over the years, being a Christian now for 20-something years, um, I went through a lot of things. And a lot of times when I was going through something, it seemed like that these two chapters helped me more than anything else. I get emails all the time from people saying, well, Brother Breaker, you know, I'm going through this, I'm going through that, what should I read in the Bible to help me? And I always say, well, go to Psalms, go to Proverbs. You know, there are a lot of, of times when David in his life was going through something and he was praying and asking God to help him. But also, Peter. There's a lot of stuff in Peter about suffering and, and how we should act, how we should react, and how God will help us in times of suffering. So these are very good chapters, and I've been looking forward to getting to this. Now what I've taught you before so far is that the book of 1 Peter, the theme is the theme of suffering. Suffering. And we're going to see that a lot in chapter 4 and 5. Now, Peter was writing his book in a time when there was suffering. So when was the book of Peter written? Well, my Bible says in the note there about 60 AD. Well, that could be, but uh, the dates in your Bible aren't inspired. Some guy came in and put those in later. And sometimes he gets the date right, sometimes he doesn't. I, I don't think that it was written about 60 AD. I think it might have been written a little later. But the theme of this book is suffering. Well, quickly, let me show you some of the verses, what we've already seen, where he's talking about suffering, and then verses that he will in these two chapters. In chapter 1, verse 11, Peter says, Searching water, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 19. Okay, the theme of 1 Peter, I told you right when I said that the theme of 1 Peter is suffering. And as we get into this today, you're going to see more and more that I told you and uh, why I told you correctly. Uh, verse 19, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience sank toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Verse 20, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Verse 23, Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Chapter 3, verse 14, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Verse 17, For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Verse 18, For Christ hath also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, that's chapter 1, 2, and 3. We've gone through all of that, and he mentioned suffering a little bit. Well, now he's going to mention suffering more in chapter 4 and verse 5. For example, 4 and verse 1, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Look at verse 13, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with also with exceeding joy. Look at verse um, 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Verse 19. Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now go to chapter 5 and verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder, and am a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Then in verse 10, But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So, do you get it? The theme of 1 Peter is suffering. And he's pointing everybody to this suffering first. The suffering of Christ. And he's saying, now look what Jesus did for you, that suffering of Jesus. Then what he's saying is, okay, if Jesus suffered and he made it through, then you can suffer too. 
And as a Christian, it's a hard life sometimes as a Christian. Because the Christian life is indeed a life of suffering. And there's a lot of things that we that are Christians suffer sometimes. And sometimes it's hard. But here we live in the church age, and in the church age there is suffering. So Peter is saying, there's the suffering of Christ, now you suffer as a Christian. Because no matter what you suffer, it will never, ever match up to what Jesus suffered for you. So if he can take it, then you can take it. Because when you're saved, he's with you. So 1 Peter is all about suffering. Now, knowing that, I think we can get an idea of when the book was written. Now, remember what I told you. I am not a hyperdispensationalist. If you haven't seen my video yet, look up my video, Why I Am Not a Hyperdispensationalist. Hyperdispensationalists overly divide the Bible. And I don't want to do that. I want to rightly divide, not overly divide. Okay? And hyperdispensationalists, they do not believe, most of them, now maybe not all of them, uh, some of them, there's, there's different you know, groups within hyperdispensationalists, so some may, some may not. But the ones that I knew, the ones that I talked to, the ones that I dealt with, they told me, they said, the book of 1 Peter is not for us today in the church age. They say that the book of 1 and 2 Peter is only for the tribulation. All right, I've gone through it, I've showed you. No, you can't say that. But what they say is, well, over here was Peter in the early book of Acts, and he was preaching something different. He was preaching Acts 2.38, and they're right. In the early book of Acts, Peter was preaching water baptism, but later we see Paul, and what does Paul preach? Paul preaches blood atonement. So Paul's preaching is about the blood. But as I've showed you, as we've gone through this, Peter gets on the same page as Paul. Now, I don't want to go through all that again, but I do recommend you go to our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study in the book of um, Acts and see that the book of Acts is a transitional book, and it goes from Peter to Paul. Oh, I did Paul in blue. Oh, well. <laughs> and so Paul is in the Bible for a reason. And what I've taught you, and I've taught you correctly is that eventually Peter and Paul got on the same page and taught the same gospel. Now, hyperdispensationalists would say, no, no, no! No, they always preach something different. So that's why they say, so you can't read First and Second Peter, we think it's only to Jews out there. Well, here's what I say, and this gives us an idea of understanding when this was written. When did the suffering start? Well, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, we see a great persecution against Christians. And some people say, well, that's when they suffered. Well, that was the beginning of the suffering of Christianity. And it was the Jews that were persecuting other Jewish believers. Then in chapter um, 9, let's go to chapter 9. This is interesting. Acts chapter 9, this is when Paul gets saved. Paul gets saved in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, look what it says. Verse 16. God is speaking to Paul. In verse 15 he says, He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now verse 16. So he didn't just go to, to Gentiles, he went to the children of Israel too? <laughs> I can't be a hyper. Uh, verse 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So God is speaking to the Apostle Paul in chapter 9 and verse 16 of the book of Acts. He says, Paul, you're going to go suffer some things for me. So Paul suffered a lot. Now, you know what happens in the book of Acts. There's a transition from Jew to Gentile, from Israel to the church, from Peter to Paul. But when that transition takes place, we clearly see God revealing to Paul, Acts chapter uh, 13, verses 38 through 39. And to me, that's the biggest change in the book of Acts. Because that's when they start preaching that you're justified by faith and not by the works of the law. By faith, not works. And so, you're justified by grace through faith. So that was the message of grace. That's the message of, well, the hypers call it, that's the grace gospel. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you called it that. Because guess what? In Acts chapter 15... 
all the early apostles come together. Peter's there and Paul's there. And they all come together and they start talking. And guess what they say? They say, yeah, Paul's right. And we see it now. We see that the message is no longer just believe who Jesus is and believe he's the Messiah, because that's what they were preaching, believe in his name. Paul got another revelation from Jesus Christ, and that revelation was we need to go around and preach what Jesus did. We need to preach about his suffering, because there was a reason that Christ suffered, and it was the blood atonement for the forgiveness of sins. So the blood atonement forgives. So you're justified through the blood. That's the Paul lean message. And if you take Paul out of the Bible, you take out the gospel of salvation, which is through faith in the blood. You take out Christ died for our sins. How he died for our sins? Shedding his blood. So it's important that we understand that. Now, as we look at the book of Peter, he's writing to people that are suffering. Well, some people say, yeah, it was written early in the church, and he's writing just to the early Jews that were suffering. He's not writing to the Gentile Christians. And you go, no, no, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right, because if we get there today, and I hope we do, I'm going to show you who he's writing to. And he was writing to saved people, whether they were Jew or Gentile. But as we go through the book, we kind of get an idea of when it was written. It's written in a time of suffering. Uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's 2 Timothy, um, what was it? Uh, 3.12. So you see suffering starting in Acts 8.1, and they were being persecuted by the Jews. But over here, you see the Gentiles coming along, and now the Gentile uh, world, the lost Gentiles, are persecuting Christians. And Paul was persecuted by the lost Gentiles, as well as the Jews. A double dose of persecution. So I believe that the book of 1 Peter was written somewhere out here. And I think probably around 66 or 65 or something like that A.D. Why do I say that? Well, that's when the first real, really bad suffering of Christians came under Nero. And Nero began to uh, persecute Christians. I think I have that in my notes later. We'll talk more about that. But if you look at history and you look at the Bible, they go hand in hand. And so you see a lot more suffering under the ministry of Paul than you do under the ministry of Peter. Under Peter's ministry, people were suffering under the hands of Jews. Oh, I forgot to read it. Let's go ahead and read it. Acts 8, 1. And that's why they moved to Antioch. Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. In Acts 8, 1 says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So there was a great persecution that came against the church. It was Jews saying, we don't want this Jesus. We don't want this Jesus. Get rid of Jesus. And they began to persecute the Jewish believers. So they had to leave Jerusalem, many of them. The apostles stayed there. And it was nice they did, because then we have chapter 15 later. But God raised up Paul and said, now Paul, now you go out and you preach. And then we see a whole lot more suffering. And it wasn't just from the Jews. It was the Gentiles beginning to kill Christians, beginning to... Uh, Put them into the, uh, what do you call that, the Colosseum, so the lions would eat them, and burning them in the stake, and putting them in the gladiatorial games. And we see Christians being killed left and right, because Christianity said, we will not bow to Caesar as God. Our God is Jesus Christ, not a man, not Caesar. Our God is God, manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ. So, the uh, book of 1 Peter is suffering. So let's begin here in verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So what Peter is doing is Peter is comparing the suffering of Jesus Christ for us with what we have to suffer in our lives for Jesus. So it's what Jesus did for us. Jesus suffered as he died for our sins. And then he's saying, so now that you're saved, if you've trusted the blood, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, be redeemed by the blood of Christ. If you're saved, you're going to suffer for Jesus. And when you suffer, you know what it does? It, it keeps you from sin. The more you suffer in the flesh, the less you sin. I don't know about you, but I know in my life, the times that I was really suffering, I was really going through something, or times that I was really hurt and, and, and I needed answers and I was going through trials and tribulations and problems, were the times of my life when I sinned the less. Because oftentimes I was on my knees praying and just going, Oh God, help! Oh God, help me, please! 
and I wasn't out doing wicked stuff. I was getting close. So when you suffer, oftentimes they might be the worst times of your life, but years later you can look back and say, you know what, those were the best times of my life because that's when I was closest to Jesus. <laughs> because he suffered for me. Now I kind of get an idea and I identify and I kind of feel like what he went through as he suffered for me. And he never sinned. Well, I'm a sinner. Well, he saved me from my sins, but he doesn't want me to sin. So what do I need to do? I need to do everything I can to stay away from sin. So there in verse 1, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Let's go over to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Now, as I read through 1 Peter, over and over and over and over again, I'm seeing Peter say something that sounds almost the exact same as what Paul said. And you go to Galatians, in Galatians, Paul tells us that he spent a couple weeks with Peter. So Peter taught Paul some stuff, and Paul taught Peter some stuff, and they got on the same page, mostly. Peter even confesses, well, some of the stuff Paul said, I, I didn't understand. But he understood the basics. He understood the basics. He understood the most important thing, which is you're saved by the blood atonement of Christ. And now that you're saved, live for Jesus. Try to win souls, and you're going to suffer. So when you suffer, well, use it to glorify God, not to sin in the flesh. And many of the things that we're reading in 1 Peter, we're going to see they line up with Paul. I've had some people ask me lately, and... Um, in emails. Brother Breaker, I thought Paul was our apostle and only was for us, Paul's epistles. Why are you saying we, we can take Peter? Well, the Bible says to rightly divide. So where Peter agrees with Paul, then that's for us. I mean, that's the simple answer. And yes, there are a lot of things that Peter and Paul said in which they were on the same same side. So not everything in First and Second Peter is to the tribulation. But then there are some things that First Peter and Second Peter say that you kind of go, well, that sounds odd. And when the rapture takes place, and the book of First and Second Peter is still here on the earth, that's going to apply to the tribulation to the Jews during that time. So your hyperdispensationalists, they get it half right. Yeah, the book of First and Second Peter can have a double double application. It can apply to tribulation, and it will in the future after the rapture. But there's a lot in First and Second Peter that is for us today, and you can't just throw it out like some people do. So Peter says, look. Cease from sin. Quit sinning. Don't sin. He says you shouldn't sin. Sin is bad. Well, that's hard because we're sinners still until we get to heaven because we're still in a sinful body. So we have to fight the flesh. Now, Paul says it this way. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Okay? So set aside... What? Well, the sin. Every weight and the sin which does you So, don't sin. Put it aside. Do your best to live for Jesus. Suffer. Your flesh wants to sin. Don't do it. Say, you know, I'd rather die than sin. That's what Jesus said. Now, maybe not vocally, but that was the whole teaching of Jesus is that he was sinless. So, basically, Jesus would rather die than ever sin. And luckily he did. Thankfully he did. He died in our place for our sins. Do you love Jesus enough that you'd rather die than sin? Whew, boy, that's something, isn't it? It says here in verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weird and faint in your minds. Consider Jesus, considering the suffering that he went through for me. Well, I could go through something for him. I could suffer for him since he suffered for me. And then it says here in verse 4, But ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So, what does the Bible teach? Does the Bible teach that we should go sin? I've heard some people say, well, I'm saved, and I'm under grace, so that means I can go sin. Uh, that's not the reason God saved us, to sin. He saved us to serve. And to serve Him means to put down our desires, our wants, and it means to suffer. Sometimes I want to do this. No, I need to do what God said rather than what I want to do. I don't want to sin. And when you get the Holy Spirit inside of you, the Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed in the, until the day of redemption. When we're saved, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And when we do sin, it grieves the Spirit within us. 
and we feel bad when we sin. Now let's look at some of the other apostles and what they taught about this, okay? And remember, Acts 15 is so important. Because that's when Peter and John and all the early apostles came together with Paul. And they said, okay, Paul, what did God tell you? Paul said, well, God told me that it's the blood that we're justified by faith, not by the works of the law, and justified through his blood. And I want you all to get a hold of that message that we're saved by grace through faith, not works. It's all what Jesus did. It's the fact that Jesus suffered for us. And you know what? The other apostles got that message, except for James. Now remember, we did our Bible study through the book of James, and James died really early in the book of Acts. And I went through James again today and read through it. I could not find one place in the book of James where it says Jesus died for our sins. I find that quite revealing. I believe I taught you right that the book of James was written first. And that was the James that was killed in the book of Acts. But the other apostles, they're all saying the same thing over and over. Jesus suffered for you. Jesus suffered for you. Well, that's the message that Paul preached. So let's look at that. Let's look at uh, 1 Peter first and see what Peter says. Well, 1 Peter 3.18, remember that. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Here's the substitutionary blood atonement of Christ, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now go back to 2.22. 222, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now look at verse 24. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. And he goes on there. So the message that Peter has given us in this book is Jesus suffered for us. He suffered for our sins. So why don't you suffer for him and not sin? That's the message that he's given. But he's telling us about the suffering of Christ for us. Christ died for our sins. Now let's look at Paul. That's the message of Paul. That's the gospel of the grace of God, that Christ died for our sins. Go to 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, I just want to show you many, many, many verses on Jesus suffering for our sins, dying in our place, the sacrifice of Jesus for you and for me. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right, God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. So the sinless Jesus, sacrifice of Jesus, the sinless one, Jesus was sinless. He was the just, died for the unjust, you and me, the sinner. So thank God for that. All right, now, Let's go to uh, Hebrews 9.26. So Hebrews 9.26, Paul says this, For then must he, who's that? Jesus, often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The message we're seeing repeated over and over and over is a sinless sacrifice on my behalf for my sins. The innocent for the guilty. Look at verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Hopefully you know this. You know this is the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. But verse 3, what does it say? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Now, let's quickly go to Galatians 1 and verse 4. So as I read the Bible... I see clearly, as I've taught you, that in the early book of Acts, it was a different message. Don't deny that. The hyper-dispensationalists are right to that extent, to that point. But I also see that the early apostles came to Paul, and Paul told them, God revealed me a message, and you guys need to preach that. And the message is, it's not works that saves us. The message is, we're justified by faith. By God's grace, by faith in the blood. It's the blood sacrifice. It's the salvation by the suffering substitute. And it's the suffering substitute of Jesus in our place who died for our sins. And Peter got that message. So I can't go along with the hyper dispensationalist and say, don't read Peter, it's not for today. It is for today because Peter is telling us the same thing Paul told us, that Jesus suffered for your sins. He bare your sins on the cross, on the tree. In Galatians 1, I believe 4 is what I want here. 
Speaking of Jesus Christ, verse 3, Galatians 1, 4 says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. So Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins. Now, let's go over to the book of John. Now, John's a little bit different. John's a hard book. If we ever get a chance to study verse by verse through the book of John, I'll do my best. There's some weird stuff in the book of John. But if you rightly divide and you understand, then you can get it. But I see one thing in John. I see John preaching the same message as Peter and Paul. Because he preaches Christ died for our sins. 1 John 2.2 2. And he is the propitiation. Well, that's Romans 3.25, the word propitiation. means the act of appeasing wrath. It's dying in the place of another to forgive. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What is he saying there? That Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Look at uh, 1 John 3, 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And then verse 4, 10, again the word propitiation. Three times the word propitiation shows up in the Bible. Romans 3, 25, 1 John 2, 2, and 1 John 4, 10. Where does the word propitiation come from? Paul. <laughs> he was the only one that used a word. So you see this guy going, oh, I got that from Paul. Jesus is our propitiation. Do you see that? I hope you do. Uh, Hyperdispensationalists don't. Um, 1 John 4.10 says, Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So Jesus for our sins, suffering in our place. All right, so go back to 1 um, Peter chapter 4, and look what it says. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. All right, so he suffered for us. He was sinless, and he died in our place for our sins. All right, after we receive the blood atonement by faith, after we're saved, what should we do? Should we continue on in sin? Should we go, man, now that I'm forgiven, I can do whatever I want? Or should we go, oh, I need to arm myself, as it says here, and have the same mind? Jesus would rather die than sin. All right, now that he saved me, well, I'd rather die than sin. I don't want to sin against him because he saved me, and he, and he, and he forgave me my sins. I want to live for him. I want to serve him. And that's what he's saying there. He's saying, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. So the message here is, after you're saved, do your absolute best to fight the flesh and get the victory over the sin in your life. If you're a fornicator, stop fornicating. If you're smoking or getting drunk or doing things like that, stop. Ask God to help you. Say, God, I don't want to do these sins. If you're a thief, don't steal. If you do, I mean, there's so many sins, I can't even you know, mention them all, but there's so many things. If you're a liar, quit lying. Do your best to live for Jesus and suffer for Jesus by not doing those things. That's the message here. And we see that message taught by Paul and John as well. But let's look at Peter again. 1 Peter 2.16. Peter says, as free... What are we? We're free in Christ. We, we, he's given us liberty. He set us free uh, from the chains of sin and, and evil. We're not going to hell. We're free. He says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Maliciousness. In Spanish, the word mal means bad. Well, that's where maliciousness comes from. Don't do bad. Don't use our liberty in Christ as an excuse to do bad. Now, uh, verse 2. Go back to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So we, when we're saved, we're still in a body of sinful flesh, unfortunately. And it still lusts. And we're supposed to, because we're the new creature inside, fight the flesh. And fight those lustful desires and not give in. Now let's look at Paul. 2 Timothy 2, 19, one of my favorite verses. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.19, Paul says, and I'll just read the end of the verse, And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What does that mean? It means depart from sin. Do everything within your power to stop sinning. You say, I, I tried, I can't. Then get up and try again. What happens if I sin? Do I lose my salvation? No, because it's the soul that's saved. And the soul belongs to God. It's called the purchased possession. Possession in Ephesians 1, uh, 14. But my body is the problem. And the Bible says you'll reap what you sow. So do everything you can to do right. If you stumble, if you fall, if you do something you shouldn't, you just say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Please help me. I don't want to do that again. And you start over. 
Go to Romans chapter 6. What does Paul say? Does Paul say, go sin now that you're saved? Or does he say, now that you're saved, uh, do everything you can to stop sinning? Well, let's look at that. Romans 6, 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. So don't sin. I mean, it's a simple message. Verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Do right, not wrong. Verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or unto obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. We believe in the gospel from the heart. Uh, obeying the gospel is believing the gospel in Romans 10. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So, when you get saved, now it's time for you to serve. Well, to serve someone else means you have to put down your wants and desires in order to do their wants and desires. Does that make sense? So, don't sin. Do everything you can to not sin. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that is one of the best uh, passages in the entire Bible about how we're not saved by works, we're saved by faith. But then look at verse 10, Ephesians 2.10, and it says there, for we, are in his, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto God, good works, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So God wants us to do good works after we're saved, not bad works. Now let's go to John, 1 John 2, 1. So the message of Peter is the message of grace. He's preaching grace. He even said in Acts 15, 11, we believe that we shall be saved by grace even as they. But he's saying grace isn't an excuse to sin. And you know what? That's exactly what Paul says as well. Um, go to uh, 1 John chapter 2, and verse 1. My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. So, what's the message here in the book of 1 Peter? Jesus died, he suffered in your place for your sins. When you, when you trust in him, you're going to suffer. When you accept the blood atonement by faith and you are saved, then the world's going to hate you. And guess what? They're going to persecute you. Well... That's a wonderful thing, because the more you suffer, the less you sin. And if God died to save us from our sins, then we should hate sin. We shouldn't want to sin. So after we're saved, we should do the best we can not to sin. So the message is simple. Jesus died for your sins. When you get saved, do your best not to sin. Serve him because you're saved. Now, I think I read it last time. I won't read it again. But in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 14, read the whole chapter, how Paul talks about man. I got saved. I'm saved. But I'm still in this sinful body of flesh. And, the w and I would do right, but sometimes I do wrong. And the wrong that I do, I feel horrible. And oh, oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this flesh? When do we quit sinning? At the rapture. Because that's when we get our glorified body. That's when this body is glorified and this body doesn't sin anymore. But until then, we have to fight this flesh because we're still in the flesh. And the flesh can sin, but we shouldn't. We should fight it with all that we have. Um, so many more verses that I could go into. Maybe I should. Uh, no, I won't. I'll just, I'll, I'll let you have a Bible study here. Uh, look up Galatians 2.20 and read that when you have time, where it talks about we're crucified with Christ, nevertheless we live. Well, as Jesus died and was buried and rose again, when we get saved, it's like that. But we're still in the body of flesh and what's risen is the spirit our spirit was dead we get saved and we have a new spirit it's alive it's quickened within us god's holy spirit read romans 6 11 through 15 read galatians 5 16 through 17 and then read romans 8 5 through 12 when you get a chance and you'll see more of this about how we shouldn't sin and how we should walk in the spirit that we fulfill not the lusts of the flesh and that's the problem and it's a big problem, and it's this one world word, lust. And guess what? Old Peter's going to talk about that next. So 1 Peter chapter 4, let's go back there. 
and in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, we read this. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to say, okay, I recognize that my body is sinful still. I have a new creature inside. My soul has been washed away uh, from all of its sins through the blood of Christ. I have the Holy Spirit in me. I'm the new creature, but I'm still in this body of flesh. And this body of flesh wants to sin. What do I need to do? I need to say, nah, I don't want to do that. So I need to fight the lusts of the flesh. Now, when I think of uh, lust, what I think of is sexual sins. And we all have hormones. God gave those to us for a reason. But they're supposed to be fulfilled in the marriage relationship, not outside of it. So most men, while they look at a woman and they go, woo, and they lust after what they see if they see a pretty woman. Women might do the same thing, but only women are a little bit different. You know, usually the old saying is men fall in love with what they see. Women fall in love with what they hear. And women usually uh, want to be sweet-talked, want to be flattered, want to... You know, they you say, oh, aren't you beautiful today? Look how pretty you are in that dress. And usually see their little cheeks turn red. And they're just, Ooh, they get they get a little, uh, um, uh, what is that called? Uh, they blush. And God made men and women different. And that's why it's easy to seduce a woman. Because that's how you seduce them, with, with great swelling words, with sweet words. And God made us different, but we have hormones. And so we have to have temperance, which is self-control, and we need to be careful. We that are men, we shouldn't give in to our lust of looking at pretty women. A lot of people today, they're hooked on pornography. It's disgusting. In the old days, before a computer, well, you had to buy a magazine, I guess. But nowadays, most people have it on their phone, and they can be tempted to look at something horrible. And that's just a shame. That's awful. So what should we do as Christians? Should we give in to that and say, oh, I can't wait to look at this or look at that? Or should we fight the flesh, as the Bible says, and not live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God? I don't want to look at that stuff. I don't want to think about those kind of things. I want to fight that. And I want you to as well. Now, this is something that uh, Paul talked about as well. And so we're going to look at Paul and Jude and John. And it seems like the problem in the day of Paul and Peter in the early part of the church is still the same problem today. Matter of fact, it's far worse today because Paul tells us in the last days they'll be seducing spirits. What do they do? They go around and try to get you to lust and give in to that lust. So we're going to look at that. But let me define the word lust first. I forgot to do that. I looked up the word lust in the 1828 dictionary. And lust means longing desire, concupiscence. Concupiscence means to lust after or desire something. Lust is a carnal appetite, an unlawful desire of carnal pleasure, evil, depraved affections, or desires. When I think of that, I think of the fleshly giving in to sin, and I think of the orgies that they did back in Rome. If you remember, Rome was in power in the time of Christ. If you've ever studied history and what Rome was like, it was so decadent. It was so wicked. It was so evil. They would get together in the festival of Bacchus. They would get filthy drunk to where they didn't even remember their name. They would all have orgies together and live in, 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 in festivals and feasts of drunkenness. And what was the reason for that? Well, number one, to give in to their lust, but also their gods that they worshipped not only allowed that, but encouraged that so that when they had all the orgies, when it was all said and done, nine months later, a bunch of the women were like this, and they were going to have a baby. And they didn't know who the father was. And the reason they wanted them to have the baby is because they wanted human sacrifice to their false gods. So the woman had the baby, and she's like, I don't know who the daddy is, so it was easier for her to give it up. And they took it to their false god, Moloch, or whatever his name was, Rimpham, or uh, Isis, or Semiramis, or Ashtar, or whoever their god they worshipped, Jupiter, um, Mercurius, or whatever. And they, they made a human sacrifice of a precious baby to their false gods. And that's disgusting. That's wicked. That's filthy. That's evil. And it all came from the lust and evil that they did. Today, it's kind of like Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras, whether you know it or not, comes from that ancient practice 
of those pagan religions. And uh, Mardi Gras is just let yourself go and do whatever and give in to your lusts. And it's a shame. I don't believe in Mardi Gras. So, should we give in to lust? Well, let's go to Romans uh, 13, 12. And again, Paul is saying the same thing Peter is. Hmm. I wonder where they got it from. Uh, Romans 13. Well, the old, all the early church got together in chapter 15, so they talked about all these things. And in uh, Romans 13, and verse 12, Paul says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness. Now, chambering is getting a room together, you know. You, what do you say to two people? Get a room, you know. Well, what do you say? Go somewhere and, and, and rent a hotel room and fornicate. No, that's not right. Don't do that. Chambering. And it says there, uh, in wantonness, wantonness is lust, not in strife and envy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So do not give in to the flesh. Don't do evil. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10. So we who are saved should not be fornicators. We shouldn't go to parties and get drunk. We shouldn't do these things because that's the flesh. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So the flesh, and here is giving into the lust of the flesh and doing things that are unclean. And I find it interesting that the context is speaking evil of other people. Hmm. That's part of the flesh, saying things about others you shouldn't. Verse 18, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. That's how you seduce someone. You speak such certain words in such a way that a person goes, Oh, I like that. Tell me more. And then they allow themselves to be deceived. And then it says, Through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. So it's evil. It's wrong. It's wicked. To live a life in which you just give in to every single desire of the flesh. That's wrong. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 3 of 2 Peter. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Well, we're living in those days. People make fun of, they scoff at the Bible. But look what it says. Walking after their own lusts. Why are people so wicked today? Because they love sin. You see, when I was a kid, I was always taught, don't do evil. Don't do wrong. Live right. Don't go fornicate. Don't go get drunk. Don't do bad things. Control yourself. But I went to a secular school where they weren't taught that. And most of the kids became sinful and wicked at a, at a young age. And I watched them grow up. And they were fornicators. They were evil people. And they did evil things. And they had loose morals and loose lifestyles. And their lives were ruined. And it was a shame. Jude chapter 1 and verse 16. I've talked to some of them after that in the last couple of years. And they all tell me, man, I have so many skeletons in my closet. I don't sleep well at night. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? When you, when you live a nice life and you do your best not to do evil things, you sleep well at night because you have nothing to regret and feel bad about. But if you live a wicked lifestyle, giving into the lust of the flesh all the time, you don't sleep well. You think about those awful things that you did. Now, the blood of Jesus can forgive all those, thank God, but it's hard to forget sometimes. So that's why it's so good that we don't sin and don't do wrong. Jude talks about this, and Jude talks about this in verse 16. Jude 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. I find it interesting that in the Bible, the people that are giving into the flesh, those that are lust, always seem to mess up with their mouth and say things they shouldn't. And they murmur, and they complain, and they speak evil. <laughs> That's part of being in the flesh. And their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And then look at verse uh, 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Well, we're in the last days. And there's more and more lustful people giving into lust. And I find it very sad. I think part of the reason is TV and computers and iPhones and things like that. Because it's now so accessible to see pictures of things you shouldn't see. And yet they're all there. So you've got to, as a Christian, you have more temptation today than you ever have. People call me all the time and say, Brother Breaker, I'm tempted to do this. I'm tempted to do that. And I don't want to sin. It makes me feel bad. And what, what do I do? And I always say, turn to 1 Corinthians 10, 13 and memorize that. 
If you don't know 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I would suggest you look up 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 and memorize every single word of it because it's a promise from God that says He'll help you if you don't want to sin and He'll help you get away from that sin so you don't give in to the temptation. All right, uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So, verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So where does lust come from? Well, it comes from your dirty heart, all right? You, your flesh desires to do evil things and lust. But the world is full of lust. And it's almost like he's saying, the, well, what the world does is try to get you to lust. So the more worldly you are, the easier it will be for you to fall into lust. So the best thing to do as a Christian is what's called separation. <laughs> Segregation, I guess I should call it. I don't want to, I'm not talking about black and white. I'm talking about segregate means dividing yourself from another group. So Christian segregation is looking at the world and saying, I don't want to be like them. I'm going to try to get away from them. And not do what the world does, not go where the world goes. Now, there's some places you have to go. you got to go to the grocery store. you got to go to the market. There's nothing wrong with that. And Paul went there and preached there. But you don't have to go to a bar. You don't have to go and to the places that the world goes in order to do their sinful wickedness. You could stay away from those places. And you should. Now, back to 1 Peter chapter 4. So, Chapter 4 and verse 2 says that she no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now notice verse 3. And verse 3 is so amazing to me. Because this proves to me that Peter is not just writing to Jews in the tribulation. He's writing here to people that were also Gentiles. And I can prove it. And that's why I say we can read 1 Peter and we can apply much of it to us today. He says here, for the time past of our life, life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in, and he gives a list here of six things. And actually, if you take verse 4, um, there's eight things. Let me write those up there before I continue reading, because I want you to see what those things are. Okay? And uh, these things are this. I'll write these up here. And remember, these are things that you did before salvation. So these are not things that you should do as a Christian. Okay, If you do this as a Christian, you ought to repent, get down on your knees and say, God, I am so sorry that I did these things because I'm not supposed to as a Christian. You can't lose salvation if you're truly saved. But if you are saved, you should do everything you possibly can to not do these things. And these things are lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, all right, excess of wine is too much. Excess is too much. So what is that? That's drunkenness. Getting drunk. Uh, number four, revelings. Revelings. Banquetings, okay. Banquetings. Now here's the one. Abominable. Look at this. Idolatries. He would not have written that if he was writing only to Jews. Because Jews are already commanded in the Old Testament not to worship idols. Who's the one that, that did that? Well, that would be the, guess what, Gentiles. And speaking evil. Alright, now, let's get to this and I'll read it, but I want it up here behind me. As I read it, I want you to be able to see it. Alright, so look what he says here. Verse 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in. So before we were saved, he's writing to Gentiles and Jews. I mean, whoever's a Christian reading this, but he's, it sounds like the majority of those he's writing to would have been lost Gentiles before who had just gotten saved through the, Paul's gospel. He's saying, now remember back then when you did these things? When you walked in lasciviousness? Lasciviousness means sexual desire that's over the edge. Lasciviousness means looseness. Irregular indulgence of animal desires, wantonness. Uh, I think of a, a loose woman. Uh, it's so sad to me to think that there's out there in this world women that are lonely. And they go to bars to pick up men for one night stands. To me that's just such a sad thing. I know they'll never be happy. The only way you'll be happy is being married and having the same man that you truly love to come home to every night. 
But just thinking about loose women and men who are, oh, men are far worse. They go to bars to pick up women and they brag about, you know, their sexual exploits and things like that. That's lasciviousness. That's a loose lifestyle. That's being a whore or a slut if you're a woman. If you're a man, it's being a stinking fornicator. And that's not the kind of person that God wants you to be if you're saved. Now, before you're saved, you, you can say, well, I didn't know better. Well, you should. I have a friend who's in the, who was in the Marines, well, actually several friends that were Marines. And he told me when they were in the Marines, they told him in the Marines, now, not only we're we trying to make you a good soldier, we want to make you a good citizen and a good father. And we recommend highly that you never commit adultery or fornication. That you find a wife, that you get married, and you live with her for the rest of your life. I thought that was neat to hear that the Marines was trying to tell these people, don't live in lusts. Try to control yourself. I thought that was neat. Well, unfortunately, many Marines that I've met, they, they didn't listen to that. Well, hopefully they'll listen to it because it's in the Bible. And as I give it to you now. But uh, look what it says here. Lasciviousness. Lust. Then it says... Excess of wine. What is that? Getting drunk. Revelings. Now, what is revelings? Um, actually, let me go back. Excess of wine. Drunkenness. Ephesians 5.18. What does Ephesians 5.18 says? Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. And that's Paul. Paul saying the same thing as Peter right here. Revelings. Revelings is feasting with noisy mer merriment. It's basically getting together like the old Vikings did, you know, or just getting drunk on mead and doing whatever you wanted. That's not right because that usually leads to banquetings. Banquetings is feasting and entertaining with rich fare and usually oftentimes leads to orgies and evil things like that. Then it says abominable idolatries. So these are the six things he says, well before you were saved you probably did these things. Don't do those anymore. And these are all connected with fornication because usually it's easier to fornicate if you're drunk. <laughs> And that's why people go to bars, because they get drunk. You know, one guy, he's sitting there drinking, and he's looking at a picture, and he's drinking, and a guy comes up and goes, what are you doing? He's going, I'm trying to make my wife look pretty so I can go home to her. <laughs> Sorry, that's a bad joke. But the more you drink alcohol, the, the more you don't see things for what they are. They used to call them beer goggles. And a lot of people will, will sin, and it's easier to fall into sin when you're drunk than when you're sober. So these are the things. Now, look at verse 4. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same ex excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So then you've got those that are rioting, and you've got those that are speaking evil. So these are all things that Peter is telling us should not be done by a Christian. These are things that the lost world does. And uh, I've heard a lot of things that I think is just disgusting. Um, in the lost world, uh, there's a thing called key parties. Have you ever heard of that? If you're a man and you're married and in your relationship and uh, you want to swap wives, if you will, wife swapping, well, they come over to each other's house, they have a dinner, and then they swap keys. And this guy's wife goes home with her, and his wife stays, and things like that. Those are things that the world does. They're called swingers. They're wicked. I wish I didn't even know this, you know, but... Well, I was in the world for a while before I got saved, so I heard these things being talked about. But that's the kind of stuff that God doesn't want Christians to do. This is the before you're saved kind of thing. After you're saved, you shouldn't do these things at all. So when I say that it looks like Peter is writing to people that were once Gentiles, I say that because this is what the Gentiles did. And the abominable idolatries, you see in uh, Exodus chapter 20, in verse 1 through 5, God says to a Jew not to have an idol. So what kind of Jew would be doing that? Hopefully none of them, because the Jews know better than to do these things. So it sounds like Peter is writing to Gentiles that had gotten saved. Somewhere out here toward the end of, of Paul's ministry. I think Paul died around 70 AD, maybe 68. So I'm thinking Peter wrote this somewhere between 66 to 64. My Bible note says around 60. Okay, it's possible he wrote that then. But there's a lot more persecution around 64, 65 when Nero did what he did. And I'll probably get to that in one of these teachings. I have it here in my notes. So more about lust. Let's look at lust. All right, I gave you some verses on lust. Let's go to some more. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 3. I cannot stress how important it is to not sin. I cannot stress how important it is to live a holy, righteous life as a Christian. 
Because when you sin, you'll never forget it. And it'll always haunt you till the day you die. And so the best thing to do is listen to the Bible and stay away from things like this. Titus chapter 3 and verse 3 says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived. Who's talking here? Paul. <laughs> Who's he writing to? Titus. And he says, Serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. All right, kind of sounds like what Peter says. Well, before we were like this. Well, now that we're saved, we shouldn't be like this. And he's saying, this is what I was like before. Um, Romans 13, 14. I'm just trying to give you as many verses as I can against lust. And it's amazing to me how all throughout the Bible, it's don't do lust. Don't give in to lust. Don't. And here we are 2,000 years later, and this is just as relevant today, if not more, than it was back then. Because we are sinners with a sinful nature, and we're always going to have problems with this sinful flesh wanting to do and see and partake in things that we shouldn't. And it's a shame. Uh, Romans 13, 14. So we've got to fight the flesh. Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 6. So Paul is in agreement with Peter. Don't give in to lust. 1 Corinthians 10, 6. Now these things were our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Alright, so don't lust after evil things as others have. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3. Are you getting the hint? <laughs> you should. Ephesians 2, 3. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Well, that sounds almost exactly what Peter is saying. You know, in the old days, before you were saved, you did these things following your lust of your flesh. Uh, look at chapter 4 and verse 22, Ephesians 4, 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the de deceitful lusts, <laughs> and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which is after God, is created into righteousness and true holiness. Well, what are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be holy as Christians. Now, let's go to the book of James. Now remember, James was written first, but it's interesting that in the book of James, even though it was written first, he's still telling who he's writing to, stay away from these lusts, because they're the problem. James 1.14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Uh, verse 15, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. So the reason that they're so against lusting is because when you lust, then you sin. Don't sin. Cease from sin. Cease and desist when it comes to sinning. Um, go to uh, James 4, 1 through 3. From whence came wars and fightings among you? Came they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Verse 5, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth us lusteth to envy? Now back to 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Do what? Be holy, verse 15 and 16. And then chapter 2 and verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So we should do everything we can to get away from lust. Alright? Now let me see here. We're almost finished and I'm going a little long, but I want to finish up here. 1 Peter chapter 4. We read verse 3 and 4. I'll read them again. For the time past of our life might suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excessive riot, speaking evil of you. I think that's interesting. He's talking about the lost people. Who are the lost people? The pagan Gentiles. And what did the pagan Gentiles do? They had a religion that taught them to lust and to give in to the lust and to do these feasts in which they could have orgies and all it was all about making a blood sacrifice to their false gods. Our God doesn't demand us to sacrifice our children. He'd rather die for us than to see us go to hell. And so he died and shed his blood for our sins. 
But if you don't do what they do, they speak evil of you. I remember that. I remember being a kid in middle school and in in, uh, high school and being made fun of by people. Oh, you're one of those? Hey, man, have you ever done this? No, I've never done that. Oh, 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 you're such an idiot. You haven't done such a... And it's like they judged you and made fun of you and laughed at you if you didn't do what they did. Well, I look back on it, I'm glad I didn't do what they did. That was sin. Anyway, verse 5. Verse 5 says, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. So God is going to judge all this someday. If you're a lost person, be prepared to stand before God and be judged for your sins. Because God will judge. And he's going to judge out here at the end of the millennial kingdom at the great white throne of judgment. Now I was going to go there and try to read that to you. I just, I'm running out of time here. And I wanted to run back and read Ephesians 5, but I don't get, I don't have a chance. Um, We're talking about what Peter says here of what we were like before and how you shouldn't do this. I wanted to read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 8. You do that, please, when you get a chance. Just pause this. I think if you hit space bar, it'll pause it. And Ephesians 5, verse 1 through 8. Verse 7 says, be not partakers with them. We should never partake when we see other people doing sins. It's never right to go sin with someone else. Now, Peter tells us here in verse 5, that people that are lost will give account to God for their sins, and they will be judged. And I find it interesting because we see this, Peter saying this in Acts chapter 10 as well. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 42, look at what Peter says. Acts 10, 42, Peter says, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Almost the exact same thing he says in verse 5 of 1 Peter 4, to judge the quick and the dead. So God will judge, and and He's going to judge you based upon your works if you're not saved. Now, if you are saved, you're not saved by works, all your works are forgiven. And God will judge you based upon your service, what you did for Him, and what you did for Him. You'll get rewards if you're saved, and if you don't, well, you don't. But if you're not saved, whoo, I hate to be in your shoes. Now, 1 Timothy 4, 1, quickly. In 1 Timothy, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 4, 1. In 2 Timothy 4.1, look at what Paul says. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. Well, that sounds just like Peter. He said that twice. Judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. And then in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, is John talking about the great white throne of judgment. You can read that at your leisure. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Well, it's all about lust. And whenever I think about lust, I think about sexual sins. And what does the Bible say? Well, let's go to Paul in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. And let's close with this, and I think I have one more verse after this. And in Hebrews chapter 13, what does the Bible say? Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So if you're one of these living in adultery or fornication, you're not doing right. And either you're lost, you're going to end up in hell, and you'll be judged by God for it someday, or you could be saved, but you're living in sin. If you are saved and you're doing these things, I know one thing about you. If you're truly saved, the Holy Spirit's inside of you, and it's going, Oh, why are you doing this? Oh, why are you doing this? And I know you feel bad, so what do you need to do? You need to get away from it. You need to get as far away from this as you can because we shouldn't be living in sin as Christians. So let's close with 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse, well, verse 19 was the verse I read to you earlier. I'll start there. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified in meat for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts. Do not give in to lusts. Flee from them. Get away from them. Do everything within your power to not live in the flesh 
and doing the lust. Flee useful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to serve him for what he's done for us. For the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance through the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. The devil wants you to give in to sin. The devil wants you to fall. The devil's out there tempting you day and night. But you know what? He doesn't have to do a lot. A lot of you are the ones tempting yourselves. <laughs> Going places you shouldn't go, seeing things you shouldn't see. What you need to do is you need to say, Lord, I love you enough that I don't want to sin. You'd rather die than sin. Well, if I'm saved, I want the same. I'd rather die than sin against you. I don't want to be guilty of these things. I want to do right. All right, well, that's it. We got through chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. So next time, I believe, we'll start in verse 6. I hope this was a blessing. I appreciate being with us. And, uh, boy, I love this book. And I can't wait to, to get into the rest of it next time. All right. God bless.